Written in Bone, Chapter 4, Page 44 The Captain The teenage boy who may have been Richard Mutton is one among many fascinating life stories that archaeologists and forensic anthropologists have rescued from the buried past of the colonial Chesapeake area. A different grave, found in Jamestown a few years before JR1225B, posed a set of puzzles and possible solutions no less compelling. The discovery began with a trash pit that William Kelso's team of archaeologists unearthed in 2002 as they excavated alongside what had been the western wall of James Fort. Within the pit, settlers had buried typical 17th century colonial trash, pieces of tobacco pipes, bricks, and oyster shells. Because these artifacts dated approximately to the 1630s, the team knew that anything beneath the trash pit would have to belong to an earlier time period. To their surprise, what they found as they continued the dig was the telltale soil stain of a grave shaft. Most graves and graveyards are treated with respect. People wouldn't customarily bury trash above a grave unless the presence of the grave had been forgotten. Two other interesting facts stood out. Unlike other graves found during the excavation of the fort, this grave was outside the fort, not within it. And because the grave lay parallel to the fort's wall, the team knew that the wall must have already been standing at the time the shaft was dug. As Kelso's team excavated the grave shaft, they screened the backfill soil that had been used to fill it centuries before. They found no colonial artifacts in the soil. In the earliest graves, we find nothing but prehistoric materials, Kelso explained. Historians and archaeologists use the term prehistoric to refer to the time before written history. The lack of colonial artifacts in the backfill didn't mean that the grave was dug before the colonists came to Jamestown, though. But because it lay parallel to the fort wall, it must have been dug after the fort was built. As Kelso described, the contents of the backfill simply meant that the grave is from a period where there isn't enough historic material around to accidentally end up in the shaft. Together with the materials in the trash pit and the presence of the fort wall, the backfill helped the team date the grave to 1607 to 1608. The shape of the burial itself indicated that the remains had been enclosed in a coffin, a rare privilege for Chesapeake colonists early in the 17th century. Because building a coffin required time, energy, and wood that could all be used in other ways, most individuals were buried in shrouds only. The use of a coffin suggested that this grave contained the remains of a person of some importance. When the archaeologists excavated down to the level where the coffin lid would have been, they made another unusual discovery. A rust-colored soil stain was outside the coffin. The stain, which was near the end of the coffin that contained the upper part of the body, narrowed suddenly and continued for about 5.5 feet, 1.6 meters. We didn't really know what it was, Kelso recalled. The rust in the soil suggested the presence of an object made of iron and, indeed, Close examination suggested that there appeared to be some sort of artifact encased in the rust. The artifact was very fragile, so it was excavated as a block, with the surrounding soil still firmly around it. The block was taken to a laboratory to be x-rayed to attempt to identify the artifact's shape before the soil was removed. The x-ray revealed an object that the archaeologists had seen in drawings from the 17th century the iron pike or point of a captain's leading staff, a lance-like weapon used by persons of high rank in the military. The pike fit on a long wooden pole called a shaft. In the grave, the long, thin soil stain that extended away from the rust-encrusted iron pike was the only remaining evidence of the shaft's, staff's wooden shaft. While the leading staff could have been used in combat, it's also possible that it was carried as a ceremonial weapon. A weapon like this one would have been placed in a grave only as a sign of respect and honor for a revered person. Kelso recalled, for example, that some of the courtiers who served Queen Elizabeth I of England had placed their own leading staffs in her grave as a sign of respect. As the archaeologists continued their work, they were delighted to discover that the skeleton in the grave was very well preserved. The remains were given the official identification number of JR1046B, but the leading staff prompted the team to dub the skeleton the captain. Other than a few missing foot bones, the skeleton was complete. As Kelso described it, on a scale of 1 to 10, the captain is a 10. 
Given the poorly preserved state of other Jamestown skeletons, such as JR1225B, why were the captain's bones in such excellent condition? After all, the captain's bones, like the others in Jamestown, had undergone a destructive alternating cycle of wet and dry conditions. His wooden coffin would have quickly deteriorated, offering no long-term protection for the bones. The answer, as in so many archaeological puzzles, is the soil. The area where the captain was buried had sandy soil with a very different consistency than the clay-filled soil that surrounded the graves of JR1225B and other colonists buried within James Fort. Water easily drains from sand, so the soil didn't remain wet for long even after heavy rains. Because the captain's bones hadn't lain in swamping underground puddles as the others had, they were better preserved. This preservation helped the team readily glean useful information from the bones. For example, while JR1225B's grave and remains had required considerable analysis to determine how he was buried, Kelso immediately felt certain that the captain was definitely shrouded. Not only were his knees and long bones positioned close together, but the bones from his right forearm had green stains, an unmistakable sign of de decomposing shroud pins. Shroud pins, straight pins like those used in sewing clothes, were used to hold together parts of a shroud. Most evidence of such pins is found around the skull. Page 48. That's because when a body was shrouded, the face was often left exposed so that family members and friends could see the individual's face as they paid their last respects. Shortly before burial, a separate piece of cloth was placed over the face and pinned in place. Well-preserved shroud pins may look almost as good as new, but such preservation of colonial shroud pins, which were usually made of copper, is rare. When buried in soil over a period of centuries, copper undergoes chemical reactions that cause it to corrode or decay. Corroded copper forms a substance called copper oxide, which leaves a green discoloration. Poorly preserved copper pins may only remain as a small green fleck or a stain on a bone or in the soil. Doug Owsley's forensic examination of the captain revealed more. The pelvic bones helped confirm the skeleton belonged to a male. Bony spurs called lipping had formed on the man's spine and right arm. Lipping is a sign of arthritis, a painful disease that often affects the joints of older people. The lipping on the captain's bones was minimal, suggesting that he had just a touch of arthritis. That plus diffused epiphyses on the long bones indicated that he was between 33 and 39 years old when he died. Features on the skull suggested he had a large, broad nose and a small, square chin. Based on the length of his leg bones, he had, he'd been about 5 feet 3 inches, 1.6 meters tall. The overall size of his bones indicated he'd been a slender rather than stocky man. Thanks to another principle of forensic anthropology, Alsey was able to ask, assess the captain's level of physical activity during his lifetime. No matter how active people are, bones appear slightly thicker in the places where muscles attach to them. When a person uses the same muscles frequently over time, however, that labor is reflected by further change in, changes in the bones. One way a body responds to a muscle being heavily used is by building more bone mass in the area, Owsley explained. The areas where he heavily used muscles are attached to bone become even more developed and defined as a result. Owsley noted that, that the places where the captain's arm muscles had been attached to the bones were slightly more developed on the right humerus, the upper arm bone, than those on the left. Still, none of the areas were as hugely developed as they would be in a person who had lived a life filled with hard labor. Observing that lower right arm bones, the ulna and radius, were slightly longer than the left ones, Owsley concluded that the captain had used his right arm more than the left. While never a hard laborer, he'd been a physically active, right-handed man. During the examination of the skull, Owsley noted that the captain was missing a few teeth. Had the teeth fallen out after the captain was buried, teeth often do, or before his death. In the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, Tooth loss was a common occurrence. By the time people reached their late 20s or 30s, they were likely to have already lost one tooth, if not more, as a result of decay. When Owsley took a closer look at the empty tooth sockets, 
he saw that new bone growth had started to fill the sockets. Bone grows only while a person is alive, so the captain must have lost the teeth long enough before his teeth for new bone growth to occur. The captain's remaining teeth showed moderate signs of wear and had a few small cavities. As Alzi continued to examine the skull, he saw extra bo bone formations on the bones inside the opening where the captain's nose had been. These kinds of changes are the result of chronic or ongoing infections that cause the tissues inside the nasal area to become inflamed. The inflammation may have made the captain sound stuffed up as if he had a cold when he talked. His left ankle had small fractures, likely the result of a severely sprained ankle that had healed before his death. Other than that, the captain's bones showed no signs of major injury or disease. The stable isotope analysis of the captain's remains showed a carbon-13 value of negative 18.83, well in keeping with people who had been eating grains that grew in England. Owsley is certain that the captain had not been in the Virginia colony for very long when he died. If he had, eating a steady diet filled with corn would have increased the value, making it less negative. Putting together the forensic examination, the isotope analysis, and his knowledge of colonial social classes, Alsey concluded that the captain had been, been a gentleman, a member of the educated upper class. Since no obvious signs of long-term disease or injury were present, Alsey thinks that the captain probably died of one of the various diseases that killed colonists within days or weeks, such as dysentery. Because these kinds of sickness act so quickly, they don't leave trace evidence in the bones. Indeed, the captain's cause of death may never be found. The captain's name. The historical record supplied an intriguing clue when Kelso's team tackled their next task, that of identifying the captain. George Percy, one of the original Jamestown colonists, kept a journal of the settlement's earliest days. A 1607 entry describes a somber yet intriguing event. The 2 and 20th day of August, there died Captain Bartholomew Gosnold, one of our council. He was honorably buried, having all the ordnance cannons in the fort shot off with many volleys of the small shot. From other historical records, Kelso knew that Bartholomew Gosnold was one of the captains of the three ships that reached Jamestown in 1607. He died later that summer after an unspecified three-week illness at the age of about 35. Could this honorably buried man be the captain? A leading staff like the one Kelso's team found in the captain's grave is certainly a sign of such a burial. The use of a shroud and a coffin would have also been fitting for a man with the status of a ship's captain and a gentleman. Page 51. Data the team had gathered via forensic analysis also fits Gosnold's biography. The captain's age range, the evidence that he had become a gentleman rather than a hard laborer, the short span of time he'd spent in the Virginia colony, and Owsley's assessment that a brief illness had likely killed him, all matched documented facts about Bartholomew Gosnell. Still, the team lacked absolute proof. The historical record revealed two other Jamestown colonists, Gabriel Archer and Ferdinando Wenman, whose age and status made them possible candidates. Laboratory analysis of the captain's teeth added more information to this complex puzzle. Much as a carbon-13 analysis can link a person's bones with the area where the person lived, the isotopes of two other elements, strontium and oxygen, and their levels in the teeth can do the same. Isotopes of those, these two elements are found in varying amounts as components of the soil in different regions. As water trickles through the soil, extremely small amounts of the isotopes are washed into it. In this way, they become part of the region's drinking water. As children drink the water, their developing teeth absorb the isotopes, which become part of the teeth's enamel, or hard outer covering. The amount of each isotope in the tooth enamel remains constant as a person grows older. By measuring these amounts and comparing them to the isotope levels in the soil of various regions, scientists can often determine where an individual grew up. The analysis of the captain's tooth enamel revealed that his remains may belong to Archer, who died in 1609 to 1610 during the starving time, or to Wenman, who died shortly thereafter in 1610. Both of these men grew up in parts of England with the soil isotope levels consistent with those found in the captain's tooth enamel. But the results don't rule out Gosnold, 
Similar soil conditions also occurred not far from the place Gazond was raised, though not in the exact location. Kelso doesn't believe that either Archer or Wenman, although important in the Jamestown settlement, had attained a status that would have warranted placing a leading staff in their graves. That was an honor reserved for a man entitled to the highest respect, as Gosnold was. As Kelso put it, we've got Bartholomew Gosnold until it can be proven otherwise. But why would an honored gentleman have been buried outside the fort, given that the majority of Jamestown's earliest dead, JR1225B among them, were buried within the fort near the area where the archaeologists think a church once stood? Kelso speculated that perhaps the Englishman made a big ceremony out of Gosnold's burial as a show of force to quell rumors that the many were dying. Burying Gosnold outside the fort with great ceremony might have been intended to create the appearance that this death was unusual and that the settlers were, on the whole, thriving. Why are Kelso and his team so gratified to have identified Gosnold's remains? He was very important, but we don't know much about him, explained Kelso. While the name Bartholomew Gosnold may be unfamiliar to contemporary Americans, he was well known and respected among English traders of his time. More important, he was also a driving force in the movement to bring English settlers to North America. Five years before the Virginia Company's 1607 expedition to found Jamestown, Gosnold explored the bays along the coast of the modern-day states of Maine and Massachusetts. In fact, he may have been the first Englishman to set foot on Massachusetts Cape Cod, which he named in May 1602. When Gosnold returned to England, he resolved that he would see North America again. He introduced his idea to return and build a settlement to a man named John Smith. Not only did John Smith become part of the Virginia Company's expedition, he also became famously known as an early leader of Jamestown and friend of Pocahontas, daughter, daughter of the Werewans, leader of the Powhatan people. Had Bartholomew Gosnold lived, he might have become an equally significant person in American history. Unfortunately, he died only three months after setting foot ashore at Jamestown. For nearly a century after Gosnold's brief time in Virginia, Jamestown served as the colony's capital. During this time, English settlers founded other towns throughout the Chesapeake and other regions. In 1698, after a fire destroyed an important government building in Jamestown, the capital was moved to the city of Williamsburg. People gradually moved away from Jamestown. Over the decades, most traces of the settlement vanished, not to be rediscovered for hundreds of years.